Good morning, everyone. My name is Jessica Sones. I'm with Diana T. Myers and Associates. Thank you for joining us for our 2020 GAPS analysis presentation. I'm excited to have you all here and share some of the information um, that we found from conducting this GAPS analysis. So some context about the presentation and some housekeeping. We're going to try to keep this presentation under an hour. I know we scheduled an hour and a half for this, but as you all know, there is a lot going on right now, and we want to be cognizant that um, there's competing priorities, including um, DMA's COVID-19 office hours, which are happening at 1030, I mean, 11 o'clock. So we're going, I think we, it is very realistic goal for us to be um, wrapping up by 11. So that's the goal. I'm hoping to present the data for around 40 minutes and then leave about 20 minutes for questions and discussion. And we also have an online feedback uh, survey. So if folks are not able to give feedback on the gaps analysis during today's presentation, you'll have an opportunity to submit feedback via the online survey as well. And we'll have the link for that at the end. I did post a link to the presentation in the chat box as well as on Workplace. So if you end up having technical difficulties or maybe you're only able to call in, um, we link to that as well. So hopefully you'll be able to follow along. So before we dive into this, I just want to acknowledge that we know that there's a changing landscape currently um, within our nation and within our world and within the COC. So this gaps analysis does not take that into account. It does not take into account that we're facing a pandemic or that the priorities are shifting very rapidly. So please keep that in mind. This does not account for um, the realities that folks on the ground are seeing day to day right now. This takes a look back period from last year. So keep that in mind. This is not the most current information available. Um, so we want to um, keep in mind that priorities may be shifting right now due to the issues that folks are facing day to day. Um, however, the reason that we are doing this gaps analysis, this is the second time that we've done sort of a comprehensive analysis um, using both HMIS data as well as um, information about funding and housing inventory to really dive into um, information to help inform new project priorities for the COC. And this is mandated by the board who says when we're making funding priorities, we want to be able to use data to drive that, whether it's COC funding or other funding opportunities that come our way. So um, I'm going to go over the agenda and then I'm going to dive into what we're hoping um, your role can be as we go through this gaps analysis. So we're going to be going through the current inventory and resource landscape within the COC. We're going to go through coordinated entry access information, data that we found through uh, diving into data within HMIS around uh, various aspects of coordinated entry data, whether that be household type, subpopulations, RAB and county level information, a snapshot of active households um, coming through coordinated entry, and then also what are the housing and service needs that we're seeing of folks coming through coordinated entry. And then we're also going to take all of that information and um, take a look at what is the housing demand versus the housing supply. So all of the information builds on itself. So by the end, we're hoping we can put all the pieces together to hopefully have a good picture of some of the needs and gaps. So what we're hoping to have you all do, um, whether you're a RAB member or maybe um, you're tuning in for the first time, um, I imagine most of you are plugged in at the RAB level, is to review the data that's presented today carefully and identify the gaps that you're seeing in your community and in your RAB. Um, we're asking RABs to compile written feedback related to the needs and gaps. We're going to be doing that today. Um, some of you may have connected already with Lauren Whitley, who is the uh, new-ish, she started last month, uh, COC staff member for Eastern PA COC. Lauren is on this call. Hi, Lauren. Um, and Lauren is going to be Hi. taking... <laughs> So if you haven't met Lauren, you'll have a chance to do that soon. 
So Lauren will be compiling the feedback from today's session to take back to the board and also to the funding committee um, to share. And also we, as I mentioned, will have an online feedback survey for folks to be able to get feedback about the gaps analysis. So we know that data tells part of a story, but we also know that sometimes data is limited, that there may be gaps and needs you're seeing in your community that aren't reflected in the data. You may say, this data tells part of the story, but I'm seeing something else in my community that's not shown in this data. We want to know that as well, because we need to have a full picture of what's going on in the communities and that you may say there's something missing here. And that's what we really want to hear from you, whether that be today, um, time permitting or through that feedback survey. So we have a lot of dense information to get through today. Um, some of it gets pretty nuanced but I'm gonna to try to stick to around 40 minutes to get through the data and save at least 20 minutes for discussion. So I might be moving quickly. Um, in terms of questions, I like to use a burning questions versus simmering questions approach, which means if you have a burning question, meaning you need to clarify something about the data, you're unsure what you're looking at, you really need to clarify something on the spot, that's totally fine. Please type it in the chat box let us know, you can unmute yourself. That may get a little unwieldy since we have a lot of folks on the call, but um, the easiest way might be to type it in the chat box. But if you have a more simmering question, meaning you have a reaction to the data, you have a general thought, musing, idea, or reaction, we are saving time for that at the end for both questions and discussion. And if I don't know the answer, I will do my best to get back to you. And I also might ask you to hold your question for a future slide if you ask something that I know we're going to get to at a future slide. Um, we actually have more data than we can actually present in this presentation for the sake of time. So we also put together a data appendix if you want to dig even deeper into the data from the gaps analysis and we'll share the link for that at the end as well it dives into some of the raw data that really we couldn't present in a, a powerpoint format and also some county level data that's a little bit difficult to drill down to in this presentation so we hope that um, you'll have a lot of feedback and reactions and thoughts Some questions to consider as we're reviewing the gaps analysis, um, not to answer right now, but to keep in the back of your head as we're going through the gaps analysis is, what is the data telling us? Where is the highest unmet need? Are there areas where needs are currently being met better than others? Does the data align with what you thought it would be? Why or why not? Are you seeing other unmet needs not represented in the data, which is what I mentioned earlier, Data may tell part of a story, but may not tell all of what you're seeing. Do you need additional information to determine what your RAB or the COC's priorities should be based on unmet needs, and what is that data? Do you foresee a need to reprioritize or reallocate funding based on the data? That may be a question for another day, but something to keep in mind. And then are there resources your community needs that cannot be funded through COC dollars and might need additional resources. And we'll get into that in just a couple of slides about funding. Some things to keep in mind is the look back period for this data is October 2018 to September 2019. And there are some limitations to the data. Um, we're primarily using coordinated entry data to look at demand for services. And there are some limitations to that data. We know not everyone who needs assistance um, for who's experiencing homelessness or housing instability presents to coordinated entry. Uh, as we were doing the analysis, uh, we heard from folks that there could be some data validity issues around coordinated entry. But with that being said, we still think the data provides a good big picture look at the needs and gaps within the COC. So we know that folks within the COC, there's a pretty wide range of um, folks who are working within the COC, including folks who are super intimately familiar with COC work and some who 
may be our partners but are not uh, doing COC work day to day. So the next few slides are for context. We're not going to go into them in detail, but we wanted to give context to some of the things we're going to be talking about. So we're going to be talking a lot about COC funded resources and folks who are coming through the COC. So we provide this chart for context of the types of housing projects and services that can be funded through COC funding, through ESG funding, and also through Home for Good. Um, sometimes there can be confusion around this, so we wanted to provide this in one snapshot, and hopefully you can use this as a reference in the future if needed. Um, this, the point we want to make with this in the big picture sense is that COC funding is one tool in a toolkit to address homelessness. It's not the end all be all. And if you work with COC funding, you know that it's limited. It's not a resource that can serve every need in your community. ESG funding is another really important tool. Home for Good funding is a relatively new funding source um, supporting um, uh, COCs in Pennsylvania to address homelessness and housing instability and is relatively flexible, but is not a necessarily a guaranteed long-term funding source. But these are the types of funding that can be blended within communities to address homelessness and housing needs. And we want to um, provide this for context. The next few slides I'm not going to go into detail on, but we're providing these for reference. If folks are maybe newer to COC work and don't know um, the nuances of these terminology, so emergency shelter, transitional housing, rapid rehousing are the terms we're going to use and also the acronyms. Joint transitional housing, rapid rehousing may be a new term to folks. It's a relatively new housing intervention that's HUD funded through COC competition. And it's a joint program where um, recipients provide both um, resources in one project type and participants can choose um, which is which fits for them. They can do transitional housing or rapid rehousing or both. And HUD really prioritizes this for communities that have large numbers of unsheltered homelessness or that lack shelter capacity. And then permanent supportive housing, other permanent housing, and coordinated entry. All righty. I think I hear a little bit of background noise. If anyone uh, thinks you might have some background noise, if you wouldn't mind muting your phone or your computer, that would be great. Alrighty, we're going to move into current inventory and resource landscape. So what is the current resource landscape within the COC? What resources does the COC have currently? So this chart is based on the 2019 HUD housing inventory chart, which is something that the COC has to submit annually to HUD. We will have a new one within the next month or two. Um, but this is the most up-to-date one that we have. So this is all of the units and beds that the COC has for folks experiencing homelessness. And these are homeless dedicated beds. So um, as you can see, the highest amount of um, units or beds in the Eastern PA COC is for emergency shelter, um, just slightly higher than those for permanent supportive housing, um, followed by rapid rehousing and then transitional housing. And then in orange are the beds for singles and couples. And then in the darker orangish red color is are the units for families. Moving on, um, we also want to give context around the current resource landscape that there are new units coming online that were recently funded but haven't launched yet um, that will um, change the landscape within the COC that we want to make sure people are aware of because it does give context to um, what's going on. So there's a new domestic violence rapid rehousing program through um, Pennsylvania Coalition Against Domestic Violence that covers Central Valley, South Central, and Northern Tier RABS for 67 units that should come online very soon in 2020. There's also a COC-wide domestic violence rapid rehousing project that will cover the other two RABs, Lehigh Valley and Pocono RABs. That was funded through this most recent competition for 68 units. 
There's a new rapid rehousing for all household types in the Lehigh Valley RAB through Third Street Alliance for nine units that was funded in the most recent competition, as well as a new rapid for all household types in the Northern Tier RAB for 18 units that was funded. So there are new resources coming online. Um, they're all rapid rehousing resources. So that may give context to them, the next slides as we go through them. So where are resources going? So this is based on the most recent HUD funding award that was released recently um, back in March, a few weeks ago. So 46% of the funding goes for PSH, 42% for RAPID, 6% for SSO. SSO is a generally coordinated entry projects. Um, and may include other types of projects such as outreach, but generally in our COC, in the Eastern PA COC, this generally is um, coordinated entry projects. Um, THRH is 4% and then HMIS is 1%. And how is that divvied up by RAB? So you'll see that South Central RAB and Lehigh Valley RAB, um, let me back up just a second. How is the housing funding divvied up by RAB. So we excluded the DV bonus projects um, for the purpose of this analysis. So the FY19 COC housing funding by RAB, 32% for the South Central RAB, 32% for the Lehigh Valley RAB, 18% for the Pocono RAB, 12% for the Central Valley RAB, and 6% for the Northern Tier RAB. And then this chart, on slide 15 shows the housing types that are funded within each RAB. Um, there is a lot of variation in COC funding levels and uses across the RABs. Um, so as you'll see here, in green is the rapid rehousing, in orange is the PSH, and in blue is THRH. So some things you'll know is the Pocono RAB has no COC funded rapid. That doesn't mean they don't have any rapid, um, which they do through ESG, but they don't have any. The Pocono RAB has no COC funded RAPID. Um, the South Central RAB on the flip side has more RAPID than PSH through COC funding. Northern Tier and Central Valley RABs have fairly close funding levels um, between RAPID and PSH. And proportionally, Lehigh Valley has much more funding in PSH than RAPID. So those are some observations about kind of how the funding is being um, distributed within the RAPs. So now we're going to dive into the data from coordinated entry that we looked at. And again, this is from that one year look back period of October 2018 to September 2019. And primarily what we looked at is who is accessing coordinated entry and what are their outcomes? So during that one year look back period, 4,396 unduplicated households were assessed through, through the Connect to Home Coordinated Entry System. So that included 1,353 families and 3,026 singles and couples. Um, also, there were 17 households with children. Um, they're not included in the pie chart since it's such a small sliver of um, households. Um, so it was about 69% singles and couples and 31% families. And when we use the term assessed, we're saying that the folks were um, had a completed VI spit out assessment via an access site or 211. And what were the outcomes um, or the CE status for those household types during that look back period? So we're going to use this terminology in some upcoming slides to walk through this terminology. So we use the term active. Active means awaiting placement through coordinated entry. Enrolled and placed means someone's been enrolled and or housed in a housing opportunity through coordinated entry. Self-resolved means someone has identified their own housing resource um, and they're no longer waiting housing through coordinated entry. And closed means they're no longer on the list for placement through coordinate entry. 
um, maybe they lost contact or they didn't meet the homeless definition. So you'll see the bar chart, the bar on the left is families and the bar on the right is singles. Um, and I bolded in blue the households who were enrolled or in place, the percentage of households enrolled in place. So you'll see there, families did have a slightly higher rate of enrollment and placement in housing than singles and couples, 30% versus 24%. Um, whereas singles and couples had a slightly higher rate of self-resolving their homelessness. 25% of singles and couples self-resolve their homelessness. That's the section in um, gold um, versus singles who had 23%. Uh, um, then we took a look at subpopulation. So um, how many um, folks in different subpopulations were accessing coordinated entry and then what were their outcomes? So you'll see here um, the number of households within these various subpopulations who were accessing coordinated entry. So 299 veteran households, 350 chronically homeless, 543 households fleeing domestic violence, 667 youth households, and then 2,644 households who didn't fall into any of those subpopulations. So the majority of households coming through coordinated entry 60% um, don't fit in, into any of the subpopulations. And there were some households that fell into more than one. So for example, someone might be a veteran who's also chronically homeless, or someone could be a youth who's also fleeing domestic violence, for example. Um, Brendan, is there a way to mute background noise? Do you know? Um, yeah, I'll mute everyone. Um, and then if you have a question and you're calling it on your phone, you just have to make sure that you dial star six to unmute yourself. Perfect. Oh, and Jessica, that includes you. If you could, uh, oh, I got you. Can you, can you? Perfect. Cool. Thank you. Alrighty. So, um, what were the outcomes for folks, um, coming through coordinate entry by subpopulation? So again, the enrolled and placement rates are in blue. Um, so of the four subpopulations, veterans had the highest rate of enrollment and placement in housing, 32%, followed by chronically homeless households at 30%. Um, interestingly, both DV households and youth have a lower placement rate than, um, I use the term general population, um, folks who aren't in any subpopulation. Youth have the highest rate of self-resolution, um, 28%. So some interesting findings about subpopulations who are coming through coordinated entry. And then we looked at coordinated entry access by RAB. So this shows the percentage of households coming through coordinated entry, um, percentage of households assessed by RAB. So 29% of households coming through coordinate entry were assessed by the South Central RAB, followed by 24% in the Lehigh Valley RAB, 22% in the Central Valley RAB, 14% in Northern Tier, and 11% in the Pocono RAB. And this breaks down the household types that were assessed in each of the RAB. So we just went through how many households were assessed by each RAB, and this shows in red, the percentage of families that were assessed by each RAB, and in orange, the percentage of singles and couples that were assessed by each RAB. Um, interestingly, the Lehigh Valley RAB assessed a higher proportion of families through CE than the other RABs, so the Lehigh Valley RAB saw 38% families. And the Northern Tier RAB, on the flip side, assessed a higher per percentage of singles, so the Northern Tier RAB saw 78% singles. And how many households who were uh, assessed through coordinate entry, let's break it down by county. So this shows the number of households who were assessed by county. So you'll see here, there were eight counties who assessed more than 200 households annually. Lehigh County assessed the highest amount of households annually. Um, almost doubling the number of households of many of the other counties at 742. 
but you'll see there Franklin, Northampton, Schuylkill, Cumberland, Monroe, Lycoming, and Blair are all assessing more than 200 households annually. And then you can see the numbers from there. So this slide shows the coordinated entry assessment status by RAP. So in blue, again, you'll see the enrollment placement rate by RAB. And then I'll also point out the gold section, which is the self-resolution rate by RAB. One thing that stood out to me here is that the northern tier RAB has the highest percentage of households who are self-resolving through coordinate entry, 41%, which is quite high um, and would be interesting to see um, what strategies are happening there, because that is, um, seems like a really positive uh, outcome that's happening. And then that's followed by the Central Valley RAP, who's seeing a 34% rate of self-resolution. Uh, the South Central RAB is seeing the highest rate of placement through housing at 35%. And then all the other um, RABs, um, Pocono, Northern Tier, and Central Valley are all hovering around 30%. The Lehigh Valley RAB had a lower percentage of households enrolled in place than the other RABs at 11%, as well as a lower rate of self-resolution. Um, I imagine a, this slide in general, folks might have um, some thoughts or ideas on what might be happening. Uh, but I think as we, in a later slide, we'll get into resource capacity within different counties. And I think that might give some insight into what might be going on um, related to this slide and um, how that may be impacting enrollment and placement rate. All right, coordinated entry assessment status by county. So I recognize there is a lot going on on this slide, so I will walk you through it. And normally I don't like to shove this much data onto one slide, but I think it's really important information, so I want to walk you through it. So at the very top of the bar chart, you'll see um, a lot of little numbers. That's the total number of households assessed by in each county. So each bar represents a county. And then each bar is the rate of active, enrolled, closed, or self-resolved. So in blue, again, is the rate of enrollment and placement in housing. And I stacked it from lowest rate of enrollment and placement to highest. So you'll see on the very far right, Huntington County has the highest enrollment placement rate of 65%. Um, and that's for 54 households. Somerset County had the second highest rate of 51% for 151 households. On the far left-hand side of the chart, you'll see there were three counties that had 0% placement rate. Um, these are counties, um, Wyoming, Lebanon, and Susquehanna, that were also assessing like a pretty small number of households annually. Wyoming, Lebanon, and Susquehanna um, assess fewer than 15 households in, um, annually. One thing I wanted to point out is um, Lehigh, Northampton, and Cumberland counties, which are three of the counties that are assessing the most households annually, um, have a relatively low placement rate compared to the other counties, um, around 11% to 18%. These are counties who are um, serving some of the highest number of households annually within the COC, so Lehigh County surveyed 742 households, Northampton 286, um, Cumberland 323. Um, you, there's also others you could look at, Schuylkill 297, Lycoming 425. So I think it's just worth noting that some of the counties who are serving the highest number of folks are having um, some of the lower enrollment placement rates. So I think it's worth talking at the RAB level about what might be going on um, in, that, in the RAB. And Elisa, I will get to that question in a future slide, which is um, rapid capacity and PSH capacity to meet the demand. So uh, we will get to that in a couple of slides, which is how much capacity does each RAB have for rapid and PSH? 
relative to the demand in their county. So you'll right here, we're really only looking at demand. What's the demand in each uh, RAB, in each RAB in each county, and how, how are they responding to it? But we haven't gotten to capacity yet. So we will get to that in a moment. And I think that may give more insight into what's going on. Total chronic households by county. I just want to note here the counties who are serving the most households who identify as chronically homeless. This is based on self-identification. So it's a little bit tricky to really get a fully accurate number on chronic. Um, but based on self-identified self numbers, Lehigh County, Cumberland County, Monroe County um, are all seeing over 50 households annually who identify as chronic, followed by Lycoming, Somerset, and Blair counties. And then you can see the numbers from there. All right, one other thing we looked at, um, which we're not going to go into detail here, but maybe worth um, looking at maybe um, at the CE level is CE assessment status by assessor type, um, whether folks were assessed by an access site or a 211 assessor. So households assessed by a physical access site versus a 211 assessor, the folks who came through a physical access site were more likely to be enrolled or placed in housing and less likely to be closed. And households assessed by an access site and 211 assessor have similar rates of self resolution. So, roughly 40% of folks are going through the physical access sites, and roughly 60% are going through 211. So, something to maybe dig a little bit deeper into. Um, it's hard to know what might be happening with this, but something that may be worth uh, digging deeper into to explore. So we're going to look quickly at a snapshot of active households. Sometimes the snapshot tells a slightly different story than annual demand. So if you look at just the households who are active at a single point in time, September 30th, 2019, there were 786 active households. 68% were singles and couples. 32% were families, so not too different than our annual snapshot. And this is where the active households um, were made up by RAB. So the highest number of active households at a single point in time were in the Lehigh Valley RAB, over double the number in other RABs, followed by the Central Valley RAB and South Central RAB. Um, the highest number of active households at a single point in time were singles and couples in the Lehigh Valley RAB, families in the Lehigh Valley RAB, singles and couples in the Central Valley RAB, and singles and couples in the South Central RAB. And again, these are active households on the queue who are waiting for housing. And then by county, snapshot of active households by county. The largest number of active households awaiting housing at a single point in time were in Lehigh County, Northampton County, Cumberland County, Blair, and Lycoming counties and you can see it scaled down from there. In the data appendix that I mentioned, the raw data for this is available. I couldn't squeeze all of the raw data on here around singles and couples versus families, but you'll see some of the county level drill downs in that data appendix. So we're gonna get into the housing and service needs around PSH demand, versus rapid demand, and then we're going to get into the question um, which was asked in the chat box about um, demand versus supply. So for those who are not familiar, just for reference, we uh, use the VI SPDAT as a reference point for calculating demand for services. The VI SPDAT is the assessment tool used to prioritize households for different interventions. I'm not going to go through this, but here is the scoring range if folks are not familiar with how the scores are calculated on the VI SPDAT. So we use the VI SPDAT and data from HMIS and coordinated entry to answer the question, what percent of households through coordinated entry are going to need various service interventions? So let me walk you through how we did this. The bar in gray 
is prevention need. So there were a percentage of households who were assessed through coordinated entry who were at risk of homelessness and not fleeing DV. So those households we categorize as having a prevention need. In green, those folks we categorize as having a rapid rehousing need or some sort of medium intensity intervention, light touch to medium in intensity intervention. So those folks were literally homeless or fleeing DV and their VI SPDAT assessment put them in that medium um, range for rapid rehousing. So that's the bar in green. The bar in yellow is PSH need. That's based on the VI SPDAT score. Um, those are folks who are literally homeless or fleeing DV and they had their VI SPDAT in the PSH range. So we also, you'll see in blue, um, many of you are familiar that PSH requires a disabling condition. We were not able to pull disabling condition out of the coordinated entry data. Um, HMIS, we weren't able to do like a custom query this year for this, but we were able to pull whether folks had a self-reported mental health need. So that was the closest sort of proxy we could get to disabling condition. It's not perfect, but it's kind of the closest uh, we could get to to a disabling condition proxy. So the hatched bar in blue is folks who have a PSH need and they also have a self-reported mental health need. So we imagine that the PSH need is probably somewhere between the yellow and the blue bar. Um, maybe it's not as high as 23%, but not as low as 18%, but somewhere in there. And then in red is chronically homeless. So folks who self-reported to be chronically homeless. We wanted to show that for reference so folks can see where those numbers are. So we're going to use the gray, the green, and the yellow bars to kind of simulate, based on these needs for prevention, rapid, and PSH, where are the needs kind of falling annually? What is the demand? So if we're looking at the, the demand based on what I just walked through, and we're looking at a single point in time, you'll see here that three, at a single point in time, there would be 329 singles and couples in the COC who need rapid rehousing. There would also be 140 singles and couples at a single point in time who need PSH. There would be 113 families who need rapid and 82 who need uh, families who need PSH. So you'll see the need for rapid rehousing for singles and couples is roughly two times greater than the need for PSH for singles and couples or rapid for families. We didn't include prevention on here because there are folks who likely need prevention resources who were not included in our analysis and the numbers are likely higher. So this is just folks who are literally homeless or fleeing DV. So this is where we bring all of it together, what we just talked about, and get into the nitty gritty of, based on everything we just talked about, what is the COC's capacity to meet the demand for services? So we took how many households are gonna need rapid rehousing or PSH annually? How many units does the COC have? And what's the capacity to meet the demand? So I'm gonna walk you through this. And I have some caveats in here. You'll see I have lots of uh, little asterisks and stars too with little uh, sub notes down there. I'm gonna walk you through all of those. Uh, we wanted to give all this information so that if you're looking back on this later and trying to say, what did they say about this? You have all of this in one place. So this chart, as you'll see on the left, it has all of the RABs on the far left of the chart. And the first blue column has households needing rapid. So we just talked about what is the annual demand for rapid? And we broke it down by RAB. The second column is rapid rehousing units. So we included what is the projected 2020 rapid rehousing inventory? So this is the most up-to-date information we have from the 2020 housing inventory chart. And we also included those new units which are coming online. So this is actually the most up-to-date information available, and it includes also projected units that we know are coming online. Then we took a turnover rate of 
basically an annual length of stay of 12 months, which was based on a COC average and a national average, which may be slightly inflated, but that's the best um, average that we could work with based on data available to calculate what's the COC's capacity to meet the demand. So you'll see Central Valley RAB had 38% capacity to meet the demand, Lehigh Valley 35%, Northern Tier 28%, Pocono 46%, and South Central 52%. A couple of things to note. This does include DV dedicated units in the rapid rehousing inventory. All of the RABs have a certain percentage of DV dedicated units. The Northern Tier RAB has uh, the highest sort of portion of their units that are DV dedicated. So that's something to keep in mind. At the bottom, you'll see I have a note about the Lehigh Valley RABs rapid rehousing units, 145 out of the 209 units are dedicated to specific populations, um, either youth or families. So that might be something that kind of contributes to what we were seeing around um, capacity to meet the demand in the Lehigh Valley RAB. That may be something to um, kind of dig deeper into at the RAB level. I'm going to let folks look at this for a moment because it's a lot of information to take in. And we can always go back to this when we get to questions. I'm going to move on to PSH. All right, so we went through the same exercise for PSH capacity to meet demand. So um, you'll see on the left PSH units for each RAB, excluding BASH units. And then how many households need PSH annually based on that exercise that we walked through of how many folks fall within the PSH range on the VI spit app? Based on that, what is the capacity of each RAB to meet the demand for households needing PSH? So you'll see in Central Valley, it's 12%, Lehigh Valley, 16%, Northern Tier, 8%, Pocono, 22%, and South Central, 13%. Um, and then chronically homeless households. We also looked at what is each RAB's capacity to meet demand for chronically homeless households. So in Central Valley, it's 31%, Lehigh Valley, 49%, Northern Tier, 33%, Pocono, 42%, and South Central, 43%. So a couple of things to note, caveats or comments. So basically, all of the RABs lack capacity to meet demand. Um, the first set of data, which is current capacity to meet demand for households falling in the VI spit at PSH range, that assumes that those households will be eligible for PSH, which, again, we know that not all of those households may necessarily be eligible for PSH if they don't have a disabling condition. And then with the chronic, um, that also assumes that those chronically homeless households would be eligible and prioritized for PSH. Some chronically homeless households actually don't fall in the VI spit at range for PSH, so that's something to keep in mind as well. So I just gave you a lot of information. The last, this slide and the previous slide is where I think people's heads tend to explode because it's a lot of information on one slide, but I want to um, make a note of that. Um, so I see a comment here about increased need as a result of the coronavirus. I don't think we'll be able to talk about that on this presentation, um, which I mentioned at the beginning of the presentation that there's that this presentation was done well in advance of what's happening now and that we recognize that there's a changing landscape and that things are changing. If you would like to talk more about the resources coming online around COVID-19 or kind of the changing landscape. Um, DMA is conducting bi-weekly office hours, and including one that's happening right at 11 o'clock. Um, and I think that will be better equipped to talk about how the system is equipped to respond to that. But I think it's worth noting that that is context that is important 
as we move forward around gaps. But I don't think that that was, this presentation was, is kind of looking at annualized need within the COC, but doesn't take into account the current context. But I think that's, like I mentioned at the beginning, it's really, really important um, context and it really elevates the need for prevention as well as um, the capacity of the current system to respond to what's happening. So thank you for that um, comment. But I don't think I will have the capacity to respond to that right now. But I think there's other forums within the COC that would be able to respond to that. All right. So we have some time for questions, as well as if folks have reactions or want to comment. I did unmute or give everyone the ability to unmute themselves. So if you're on Skype, you can hit the mute button or the microphone at the bottom of the screen to unmute yourself if you're on the phone and you want to ask a question if you hit star six uh, you should be able to unmute yourself Jen, that is a very interesting question. Um, ability of the Eastern COC to meet needs versus the Western COC. I might have to ponder that a little bit more, but I can give you some kind of immediate uh, reactions, um, which is that the Western COC has um, more than enough PSH capacity to meet the demands for chronically homeless households. So you'll see here um, in the uh, the Eastern PACOC, um, there's not quite enough PSH capacity to meet the demand for chronically homeless households, but the Western COC is at, on the cusp of being able to um, almost effectively end chronically homeless households with their current PSH capacity. Um, off the top of my head, the other difference that I've seen is that there's far fewer um, kind of noticeable differences, but there's only two RABs in the West. Um, but they're, they're, um, their place, there are discrepancies as well between their placement rates between the RABs, and um, a lot of it similar to here is due to demand. There are counties who are seeing the highest demand especially for rapid, are having the most difficult time um, placing folks in rapid. So those are some similarities and differences. Um, chronic is one difference. And then counties with the highest demand for rapid are having the hardest time placing folks, um, just because I think the system is trying to right size itself, both in the east and west, based on demand. And I think that's it's been happening over the course of years, but I think it's an ongoing journey to right size based on where the needs are. So those are those are my thoughts off the top of my head, but I think I would have to um, look a little bit closer to see that. That's a really good question. If folks have thoughts about any of the discussion questions about what you're seeing from the data, other unmet needs not represented in the data, which I know um, Eric mentioned, COVID-19 needs, which are obviously not represented in the data at all since this was conducted before we were even confronting what's happening now. I think that's not clearly represented and will have to be, um, the needs of the COC will have to be realigned with what the needs are currently is a really important point. Um, do you need additional information, um, resources that are not COC funded, anything like that?
I think it's, this is Megan from Adams County and Franklin County. It's helpful to see the data. I mean, I think that confirms what we're seeing. It, it does let us know the difficulty we're having with permanent supportive housing um, and trying to help those folks who need that kind of support, but we can't get it for them. And um, so it validates some of those pieces. That's a good point. Um, to Jen's question, another thing I'm recalling as well, which I think is a challenge in the East and West is smaller counties who are feeling under-resourced with certain, um, certain things that they need, whether it be PSH um, or RAPID, who don't necessarily have the capacity to take on um, running those programs or don't necessarily have the need to necessitate, for example, a PSH program at the county level, but still need those resources. So I know the East and the West um, both are having conversations about regional projects and how to implement those. Um, the West has two very large um, regional rapid rehousing projects um, that cover entire RABs. I know the East has that as well in um, specific RABs, but that's another challenge that I think is coming up in both COCs that I just um, thought of. Um, Megan's comment made me think of that as well. Other thoughts and comments? No, this is not the most conducive forum to sharing feedback. But feel free to jump in. This is Megan again. As we have time to look through the presentation again, can we forward questions up? Yes, you can forward questions to me at um, jessica at dma-housing.com. I'll put that in the chat box. And I also posted in the chat box the link to the feedback survey, which is also in your um, in the hard copy of the or the digital copy, I guess, of the presentation, which I um, posted. So if you are one who wants to maybe sit with the information a bit and then post feedback, you are more than welcome to submit the online survey. Uh, we are trying to get feedback within the next week to compile that. Hopefully it's still fresh in your mind and you can give feedback within the next week. But all of the feedback will be compiled for the board as well as the funding committee. So it's really important that folks who have feedback provide it because we know that, as I mentioned before, um, data is only as good as um, the story it tells. We know it doesn't always tell the whole story. Jen's question is, can the data be broken down by the RAB level? Most of the data is broken down by the RAB level, but if you find a data point that wasn't um, broken down by the RAB level, then please let me know and I can see if I have it available at the RAB level. So um, the link on the screen has the supplemental data appendix. That data appendix has data, more data at the RAB level, at the county level. But if you find a data point that's not broken down at the RAB level, feel free to email me and I can see if I have it. Most of the data I think we have at the RAB level. Um, but if not, let me know. Lisa's question is a very good one. What can the COC do to help right size the supply? I can give you my reaction, but I'd be interested to hear others, which is um, a thoughtful process of reallocation and new project solicitation, which is very much easier said than done. But I think that's what um, that's kind of the process that um, I know we've seen some other COCs that DMA works with go through is really being intentional about what are projects that we need, where do we need them, what are projects that we don't um, necessarily need or that not, are not serving the COC anymore, and um, what does that project process look like. And I think that's a very intentional process that, um, that could take place um, at 
the RAB board and funding committee level, but I imagine others probably have thoughts on that. Hi, this is Megan again from Adams and Franklin. Yeah, I agree. It has to be that thoughtful process. My worry is that we'll move um, existing funding to other areas that we see as priorities, which will create gaps again in existing places. So it's trying to figure out where you actually really don't need those services, as opposed to kind of the, the quicker response of, oh, we see we need it here. We can just pull it from this place. Right. Yeah. And I think that's the that's the dance of not making sure you're not removing services from somewhere that needs them. Right. Because rebuilding services later costs more money um, and is so complex to do. And sometimes I think that that piece gets missed. Um, Jen's question was about the 34 rapid rehousing units in the Pocono RAB. I believe you're referencing the um, DV bonus. Let me go. I'm sorry for my clicking, which is looking crazy. Um, the DV bonus rapid rehousing. Um, that was funded in the FY 2019 competition. So that could come online later in 2020 or in 2021. It depends how quick HUD is with their contracting. Um, I know that uh, that doesn't answer your question, but I think it's realistic to say late 2020 or um, hopefully late 2020. Hopefully it doesn't go too far into 2021, um, but Maria Williams at PCADV would likely be the best person to talk to about that. All right, it's 1057. If anyone has a final thought, question, comment. Thank you all for your thoughtful questions and comments. Um, I'm more than happy to answer more questions as you come across them, especially as you're reviewing this in more detail please um, respond to the survey if you can. And again, I posted that in the chat box and give your feedback. We are reading it, we are submitting it to the board um, and it will go to the funding committee. And it is really valuable to get your impact about what you're really seeing at the community level. So thank you all so much for your time. I know some of you will probably have to jump off. You're balancing many things and probably are some of you are jumping on the COVID-19 office hours call. We really appreciate your time and thank you for joining us today. And again, feel free to reach out with any questions or comments. Um, we're happy to talk through them with you. Thanks, Jessica, and thanks everyone for participating today. Um, like I said, this was recorded. Um, I will have it uploaded to YouTube hopefully today. If not, it'll be available by next week. Thanks, Brandon. Thanks, everyone.